The Night the Munster Walked, Part 2. Papa was an editor and publisher of the Aidenville Weekly Advocate, was considered the smartest man in town because he was the only one who had ever gone to college. Uncle Mark was considered one of the smartest peace officers in Utah. By the time Tom got through of his first scheme of the year, Papa Wet was ready to admit he was the dumbest man in town except for Uncle Tom. It all started our first day back at school during morning recess. A new kid in town named Parley Benson was showing off a genuine bowie knife his father had given him for Christmas. Parley was Tom, Tom's age, had yellow hair, and he always wore a coonskin cap. I knew, Pom, I knew Tom's great friend was working furiously to get that bowie knife while he was riding me home on the handlebars of his new bike. I was enjoying the ride as I looked at the trees planted by early Mormon pioneers that lined both sides of Main Street. Aidenville was a typical small Mormon town, but quite up to date. There were electrical light poles all along Main Street, and we had telephones. There were wooden sidewalks in front of the stores. Straight ahead, I could see the railroad track that separated the west side of town from the east side. Across the tracks on the east side were two saloons, the Sheepman's Hotel, a rooming house, and some stores. That is some bowie knife that new kid got for Christmas, Tom said. I turned my head, and sure enough, he had that old scheming look on his face. Schwinn was right, I said. You only pretended to reform to get this bike for Christmas. You talk as though I were some kind of crook, Tom said, pretending I hurt his feelings. Just because my great brain makes me smarter than any kid in town and a lot of grown-ups doesn't make me a crook. Papa always says that it's brains that count in this world. But Papa didn't say you are supposed to use your great brains to go around swindling people, I said. Who did I ever swindle, Tom demanded. Me and every kid in town, I said without a moment's hesitation. No two people can make a deal without both of them agreeing to it, he said. Right? Right, I said. And in all the deals we ever made, you agreed. Right, J.D.? I nodded my head. And no two people can make a bet without both of them believing they are going to win, he said. Right? Right again, I answered, wondering what he was leading up to. Then you've either got to admit that you are stupid and an easy mark, or that I've swind I've never swindled you in my life, Tom said. I sure as heck wasn't going to admit that I was stupid and an easy mark. I guess you are right, I said. I'm sorry I called you a crook. But you did call me a crook, Tom said. And when I tell Papa and Mama that you called your own brother a crook, it will break their hearts. Please don't tell them, I pleaded. If I agree not to tell them, Tom said, I think you should be punished for daring to call me a crook. I'll do anything you want, I said quickly. Tom thought for a moment. If you do my chores for a week, I just might not tell Papa and Mama, he finally said. It's a deal, I said, and how I wished I'd learned to keep my big mouth shut. I knew if I told Papa and Mama that Tom was a crook, it would break their hearts. But I also knew if I told them I was stupid and an easy mark, that would break their hearts too. The more I thought about it, the more grateful I was to Tom for letting me off so easy. After we changed clothes, I filled up all the wood boxes in our kitchen, dining, kitchen, dining room, and parlor. Then I began bringing in buckets filled with coal from our coal and wood shed. Mama and Aunt Bertha were kneading biscuit dough for supper. Mama tilted her head, piled high with long golden braids, and looked at me. Why are you doing your brother's chores? she asked. It is all right, Mama, I said as I put down a heavy bucket filled with coal beside our big kitchen range. I'm perfectly satisfied with the deal. Aunt Bertha, who wasn't really our aunt, but had lived with us so long we just... She was just like one of the family, looked down at me from her great height as she brushed a strand of gray hair from her forehead with the back of her hand. She had hands and feet as big as a man's. Deal, she said as if it were a dirty word. It was too good to be true. I knew it couldn't last. Tom is at it again. Mama looked concerned. Is Tom D. taking advantage of you, she asked. No, Mama, I said, because I thought Tom had let me off easy. 
Tom sat on the corral fence while I fed and watered the chickens, milk, cow, team of horses, and swims Mustang Dusty. I was exhausted when I joined Tom on the corral fence. That new kid, Parley Vinson, sure likes to brag, Tom said. You mean how he bragged about his father being an anime, animal bounty hunter for the ranchers, I asked? Yes, Tom answered, and how brave his father is and how brave he is. I guess it does take a lot of courage to track down and kill mountain lions, wolves, coyotes, and other animals that kill livestock, I said. Sure it does, but that doesn't make Parley brave like his father, Tom said. If there is anything I can't stand, it is a kid who boasts. I knew if Tom couldn't stand it, he was going to put a stop to it. Are you going to put your great brain to work to cure Parley of his bragging? I asked. I couldn't help feel excited. Tom grinned. And teach him a lesson at the same time, he said. I'd hate to be in his shoes, I said.